Lolo, welcome back. In this one, we are looking over, analyzing, reviewing, reacting to The Strongest Magician in Demon Lord's Army Was a Human, Episode 3. And oh boy, does this show keep feeling very mid. Now, first of all here, I just want to talk a bit about this whole traitor arc they really got into this episode. As we find out throughout the episode, yes, Ike does end up concluding after meeting the blonde in the prison here that no, she didn't have anything to do with the assassination attempt, even though the arrow was from like her unit, so he d decides that yes, it must be a traitor. He gathers all his people in a group and finds the traitor in his own brigade, and then that leads him to the ringleader of the local rebellion, or revolution, I suppose, being the second in command of the 7th Corps, which I suppose is technically his superior because he's only a brigade commander. Now, this of course leads to things being set in motion, him going to see Sephiro, the commander waifu and then they have this whole showdown later in the episode now i have many questions regarding why the developments took the path they did this episode first of all why did sephiro when ike goes to sort of talk to her about this traitor why does she seem like she already knows and even ike comments about this what you knew and she responds with i'd guessed or i thought so something along those lines it's like really you thought that your second in command might be a traitor or you had an inkling he might be a traitor, but so far you've done nothing. Nothing at all. I mean, he's your second in command. I mean, if you had even the slightest inkling he might be a traitor or committing sort of revolutionary plots, he should be dealt with immediately. Not just, yeah, I thought he maybe was one. I wasn't sure, though. I didn't do anything about it. Really, Sephiro, you, you, you just did nothing. Okay, I guess so. Why not? And she didn't even inform Ike that as... She seemingly kind of had an inkling that he might have been a traitor? Question mark? Again, that part wasn't totally clear to me, but if she did, why did she not inform Ike at all that, you know, this person she is seemingly close to, and the relationship between Ike and her seemingly being, you know, pretty close in comparison to everyone else there in the Demon Army, she didn't even want to mention that, that he might be in danger or there might be a traitor in his midst? That just seems kind of weird and odd and not really logical. But anyhow, moving on. After this, Ike, I guess, brings Sephiro along to deal with this rebellion and sort of kick the shit out of Jace, this second-in-command traitor, and his army. Which brings up another question of, okay, why did Ike bring along Sephiro to this mission, so to speak? I mean, Ike is supposedly, going by the title, the strongest magician in the Demon Lord's army, right? So why did he have to bring his superior, his commander, to deal the AoE attack? Can't he also use attack spells? And more specifically, when I think this is Ivalis, Ivalias? Anyhow, the city that he is supposed to build up and doubles its tax revenue. Since this is the city, I'm pretty sure, why did he bring along Sephiro, who he knows is not exactly kind to restraint, or very familiar with restraint, and just blasts off her, her magic spell, destroying buildings and streets alike. Like, you know that this is her nature. You even commented in episode one, I think, of how reckless she is and how she just blasts everything and thinks about consequences later. When you know this, even though you told her to be restrained, when you know her nature, why did you bring her along? When this damage will probably put you back weeks, or even more, with rebuilding time and any other casualties that might may occur due to this AoE bombardment of the city, and how will that hamper your efforts to double its, the tax revenue of the city, and how will that impact your position with the Demon Lord? Like, these are things you should consider when you are supposedly a very smart guy having all this ancient civilization knowledge, right? This is just another very odd point to me, and why he decided to do this, or if Sephiro, I guess, just demanded to come? No idea, really. But yes, back on the other point, why didn't Ike just deal with this himself? Like, this was a good opportunity, I feel like, for him to show off some awesome spell he has, to show why he is so powerful, to just sort of hammer it in for the viewers, how easily he can deal with even a second-in-command, and his army with his own might. Why did you have to bring in Sephiro to do this for him and him just doing some sort of small hand-to-hand -hand combat instead? And then it sort of seems like he needs her help even though he is supposed to be the strongest mage in the entire army, right? Or is he going to be in the future but he isn't now? I don't know. That, that has made me feel like the MC is kind of weak. They needed help in this situation or that he didn't really use any sort of big attack himself. Not sure if that was the intention or not, but that's what I left feeling after that interaction, so to speak. After this whole fight, we guess we do find out that this goblin second-in-command, who apparently was plotting with the third 
brigade commander or a third army commander, corps commander. They wanted to topple the demon lord because she's too pacifist and won't let them just randomly kill people for no reason. It's like, okay, I guess that is one reason why you would try to revolt. But in this case, especially as the main character, Ike here, makes the comment that Jace is a very intelligent goblin and, you know, he, he has his wits about him. He's, he's a smart guy and he's apparently been plotting this traitor rebellion for a while and he's the one that you know got the person or goblin whatever to shoot ike with the arrow why didn't he have a backup plan like if he is so smart so intelligent and his entire rebellion here his entire sort of build up of the revolution here being so dependent on him not being discovered why did he not have a backup plan if the arrow is the single arrow shot failed like didn't why did he not have any sort of backup plan to finish ike off if he, if he didn't die from the arrow why did he think that he would die from the arrow i mean he's a demon brigade commander and even jace the goblin here comments at the end of the episode that yeah i now see why you're talking about being so strong and powerful like if you know his reputation you know how supposedly powerful he is why did you only send one person to shoot one arrow at him and that's it no backup plan, no nothing. Just leave it to chance. And then if it survives, well, then I guess our, our entire plan is fucked. Really? Y you have no contingencies? Doesn't sound like a very smart person to me. And not someone I would have included in plotting a revolution. Just saying. I also have to question why exactly they wanted to go after Ike first in this plan. Is it because Ike is like the embodiment of restraint? And that everyone knows he's like the most soft, quote unquote, of all the demon sort of commanders? Or is there some other reason or just because the plot needed it to happen. I don't really know, they don't really explain it. I also have questions of why the goblin army was in the city. Because again, this is the same city he is supposed to build up, right? I'm pretty sure. So why is the goblin army in the city? I thought this city was relegated to Ike and his brigade. Why is there another brigade in the city as well? Is it split up into parts? I don't know. It does also showcase in the episode that Sephiro is apparently the more brutal of the two, which I guess makes sense because she is a demon. She doesn't really have, you know, mercy or pity or other sort of feelings that hamper Ike. So it makes sense that she's more of the brutal, you know, let, let's just off him and be done with it attitude. But even before Sephiro can sort of interrogate him, the goblin suddenly is taken by poison and is dying. And of course, before he dies, oh yeah, since I was betrayed by my own, I'll blurt out the name of my accomplice. Okay, sure, whatever. But this poison, was he poisoned beforehand? If he was poisoned beforehand, why? How? Like, why did the poison take this long exactly to activate and just activate exactly when he was about to be interrogated? That's very convenient. And if he was poisoned beforehand, why would he be poisoned when it wasn't even clear he was found out? I don't know really at all. And if it wasn't sort of pre-planned poison, but sort of like a poison spell, how would that work? I don't know. But he just randomly gets poisoned and dies. Okay, I guess. A lot of questions in this episode that I just don't know the answer to. And it's very vexing. I don't want to understand what's going on here. I want more information. But it doesn't seem like this sort of cryptic non-answers we get on many points has a purpose other than just not really telling us exactly what is going on. Which leads to frustration more than anything else, at least for me. Anyhow though, they go to the Demon Lord at the end of the episode and then it seems like the next episode will be some sort of back and forth word game of no, he's the traitor, no, he's the traitor or... Something along those lines, most likely. Anyhow, though, if you made it this far in the video, do please remember to like and subscribe. I greatly appreciate that support. Thank you. I want to quickly talk about a few inconsistencies, too. Well, more than the already inconsistencies we've had. Like, this blonde commander girl from the Rose Knight whatnot in prison apparently knows that Ike is the brigade commander of the city she just attacked. How does she know this? Do they have spies in the city? Like, how do they know this specific information? Is it sort of well known? I don't really know, but we don't begin any information on it either. Feels kind of odd to me. Another thing I still am a bit perplexed about is why they have Lilith in this show. Like, she's the very, you know, lovey-dovey demon wife who that is super into Ike. And we get another sort of section in, in this episode of her just being like, oh, Ike, let's go to somewhere private where we can relax and, you know, have lovey-dovey fun. Uh-huh. Like, why is she really in this show? I mean, it seems that the anime wants to sort of tell a semi-serious story, but at the same time, they have these elements that are very sort of gag humor -y and non-serious sort of harem-esque romance things going on. Like, why is she even in here? She doesn't add anything to the show right now, and she just purely seems to be there to add this sort of harem-esque feel to the show, but that doesn't in any way help or add to the supposed maybe serious tone of the anime. I mean, they are trying to cover, let's say, semi-serious themes here, right? We have, you know, traitors, we have a rebellion brewing, we have 
no political intrigue on both sides of the aisle here. It seems to be a semi-serious story, or at least it wants to be. So why include a character like Lilith that doesn't seem to do anything except adding in this sort of semi-comedic relief and or waifu harem feel to the show? But I guess they just wanted to put that character in because reasons? I don't know. But for me, it's not adding anything to the show and rather actively taking away from what should be, in my opinion, the focus of the show. They do also again play into the ancient civilization thing in this episode. Like, okay, clearly Ike has this ancient civilization knowledge and everyone is done, including the maid of, huh? When he talks about rudimentary economics. So clearly this world has sort of been thrown back into the stone ages, or at least decently far back, in comparison to this ancient civilization, which was probably about the same level as our world, right? It might just be that this maid, who is a slave by the way, and has had no education I'm sure, it might just be that she doesn't understand it, but I think the feel we are supposed to come away from with this interaction is that generally people in this world don't understand this. So I guess it'll be interesting-ish to see where they go with that and this sort of ancient civilization knowledge later on. Anyhow though, as a whole here, it feels like another very mid episode. Like, I just can't get invested right now. I have so many questions every episode, I have so many comments, I feel like there are many inconsistencies and questions don't come up during the episode I don't get answered that may make me just more annoyed or off-put from the anime. I also have to say the animation quality at times feels pretty bad. I'm not sure if it's sort of CGI or what it is, but a few of the sort of animation parts of the show just feels very <sighs> off. It just feels off to me in some ways. Not all of it, but some of it just feels very bad in some ways. Maybe it's CGI, I don't know. And you know, though, what did you think of episode 3 of The Strongest Magician in Demon's Arm as a Human? Like it, hate it, leave all those thoughts down below. And as always, any other thoughts on my video or commentary, leave those down below as well. That being said, hope you have a nice day, keep watching anime, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.